kicking off with the French introduction. <laughs> really not sure if I'm gonna continue with the whole <laughs> language thing. I don't mind it. It's I'm back myself in two weeks in a row. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm the most. I am the potch. And we have got EJ up in this bitch as per usual. He never misses a beat. We love him. The Room 10 company with our other tech wizard, Big Willie. And they are starting up their own company. So get him around on Facebook, Instagram, all the rest. If you need any tech stuff done, that's about as far as my knowledge goes. <laughs> but hit them up because love they it. are experts. How are you today, Ponchi? Feeling good, mate. Uh, actually, you've had a mare this morning <laughs> coming to the studio. <laughs> I've asked him to pick me up. We've had an early interview with Jared Lyons, which was an absolutely scintillating interview. Probably one of the best ones we've done yet. And you've driven to the wrong suburb to pick me up. And not only have you gone past, I've told you to come back. You've driven to another wrong place again. So you started off a bit shaky today, mate. But it's I good did, to see you've settled your nerves. I have. I've settled my nerves. And we've got Jared Lyons, which, you know, we've had all Australians. We've had club champions on the podcast. We've had, but they're all small fry co- compared to a Brisbane Lions player. Anybody who gets to, you know, take the field with the big O, Oscar McInerney, every week, <laughs> which Jared Lyons has the privilege of doing, is is the man. So, excited about that. Now, Ponchi, launch us into some clips, please, please big boy. All right. This was a send-in by one of the boys at the footy club I've been training at recently, but the Vaffer's done, so unfortunately the season's off. But Simo sent this one in, so pump up to the big boy. <laughs> So for context of people who are listening, uh, the boys are at the TAB, they're on the chariot races, he's on the punt, and this bloke's standing up right in front of the screen, and clearly his horse doesn't win at the end because he's not too happy with the result, but that is a bit of carry-on from the boys. We love that. Yes. Now, do you want to introduce this next video? <laughs> yes, I would love to, mate. So it is two young... You may have seen this clip before. It's a classic. Absolutely. Two young girls filming a live video on Facebook, I believe, and their mum comes in, and she's not too happy with the girls, and here's why. I'm going to send Cher Lloyd by Cher Lloyd or Rebecca G then. And don't forget all the trouble we got in Why does somebody not know how to flush a toilet after they've had a shit? What do you mean? Well, I was fucking one of yous. <laughs> Disgusting! <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting. It was one of yous. <laughs> oh, right. But I'd love to get your take on that, Ponchi. And the reason why I'd love to get your take on that so much is that because I feel like, you know, when, when, when we played that video just then, something in your face sort of related to that. Like there was an emotional connection to that. And I reckon the reason why is because I've got some intel from <laughs> two oh, meter Peter and no. two Camilla. I was like, where are you going with this? Apparently, and my yellow flag is being summoned. Apparently, when you were living on the Gold Coast, together you used to take poos and not flush the toilet so thank you two meter peter for that that is absolutely false <laughs> i i flush the toilet <laughs> that is the biggest cheat up ever that's just what you mean back at you um no. i no i don't have an anything oh, I, I i don't know whether the truth is coming to this I will admit this though. Actually, this is something I can admit. So you know, oh, I guess we're at like our fifteen to eighteen year old days. Where, I don't know, how do you say, it? like an avid pooer? We we appreciate a poo, <laughs> and um, we and so much so that you know sometimes the boy would, the boys would poo with the door open. I did it when we first moved into the house with the boys, and I just thought, <laughs> you know, the boys would have a laugh, poo with the door open, yak it up. The first time I did it. Two meter Peter walks past and he's like, this is not appropriate. <laughs> we're, we are not doing this. We're men. We, we are, shit with the door open. We are not doing this in his house. So, um, yeah, I don't think he was too happy about me shitting with the door open. <laughs> I'll, I'll give him that. Well, but. thank you for the intel, Two meter Peter. I fully believe you. I think that Ponch regularly pooed and left the, left the poo in the toilet and didn't flush it, didn't wash his hands either. But that's just what I think. Anyway, mate, moving on. This week's... <laughs> This week's round revelations, uh, and you yeah. have gone deep. Yep. So I've gone pretty in depth. I've got four things that kind of uh, came up this week that I think was worth noting. So the first one is Alistair Clarkson, and he's the absolute king of the game. Uh, and when he speaks in the media, people clearly listen because the tackling was an issue that he had the week before that things weren't getting paid. But this week, clearly, he's in his press conference. He's announced it, and so did um, Chris Scott, and 
now that the rules have been changed and the the tackling has been tightened down. So something that wouldn't have been paid holding the ball is now being paid holding the ball. So that's that's the first thing. So Alistair, and, Clark. Alistair Clarkson, that I love that because he has just flexed on the competition. Yeah. You've got to love it. Like he's the king. He's coached so many premierships, and I've not seen that much pull since Dustin Martin after the 2017 Grand Final, letting all of his <laughs> mates into the club. Yeah. About 50 of them. Mate, so when he flexes, people notice. So, you know, Clarko has got a bit of pull in the league. The second one this week that has absolutely done my head in. Now, I've watched eight out of nine games this week. The only game I missed was the Bulldogs and North. Uh, players taking advantage when it's not there. I like you, It just frustrates me that they get the ball. You have time to take a couple steps, look around and stop. If you're in congestion, don't take the advantage because it's not there and don't try and manifest something uh, by playing quick. Let the bloke take his advantage and let him clearly um, spot up a target that will be there because it's just... I felt, I felt myself shouting at the, the TV all week about this. So that's something that grind my gears. <coughs> now, a bit more love. Um, and this actually kind of relates to the Alistair Clarkson tackling thing. Jacob Townsend. Now, he has played four years at Richmond and four years f- before that at GWS. Played every single game for Essendon. And I think I want to give him a bit of love. He's a premiership player. A lot of people probably don't even know him. He got delisted last year. Essendon gave him a chance. And rightfully so, he had the game-winning shot against Carlton and just came up a metre short. If he kicked that, he would have been getting so much more praise. But this week, Collingwood came storming home. The last four goals um, against Essendon. And they're on the charge. They're only down by three points. Uh, The ball's in dispute in the back line and Townsend does a game-winning tackle. Now, like I said, the week before, would that have been paid holding the ball? No, because of Alistair Clarkson and what he said. They were tied this week. But regardless, he made a really game-saving tackle, stopped the momentum and kicked the goal. And I think he's someone who just needs a bit more love in the media because... Absolutely. Yeah, he's played 52 games. He's been in the system for 10 years, I believe. Yeah, deserves deserves a pump up and yeah. rightfully so. And that's why I'm giving it to him. So, well done, you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a, bit, a bit Jimmy Carr there. Uh, and the last one is uh, the Saints. And especially someone who needs a bit of love again. The media love to tear down uh, a coach. Uh, they love to strip them to pieces um, when they're not going well. But rarely do they give them the... Uh, the the guys that they deserve. Yeah, the exactly. that they deserve. Ratton this week, what he's done, he puts Jack Steele onto Cripps. He shut Cripps down and was arguably best on. Massive move that he's put there. But even bigger was putting Geary uh, as a forward defensive player, making Sam Doherty accountable. And Geary's come in and kicked two goals in the first quarter, nearly kicked four for the game. And those are two moves that really <coughs> rattled the Carlton um, Blues. And he's, he's gone against the two ca- uh, captains of the club. So mm. I think... Brett Ratton, like, applauds to you because a lot of coaches don't get the limelight they deserve. So the Saints are in ripping form and you're definitely a massive uh, contributor to that. Yeah, I I think that I would disagree that the Geary was a bigger move because I think that Steele shutting down Cripps and actually playing better than him was just... it It was a really, really significant moment for me. And when I was looking at them both at the center bounce, um, they... Steele is just as big as Cripps and he yeah. does not get nearly the plaudits because obviously he hasn't done quite what Cripps has done but he is a big, big midfielder looks a little bit more slender but he was really, really one to watch Yeah, well I'm definitely contesting that because Doherty is really important to their back line and he has been in such good form and for Geary to kick two early goals that makes him accountable he can't be free in the back line so for me, like shutting down Doherty that's the main part of their defence shutting down Cripps is the main part of their midfield he's taking down two big parts of uh, the Carlton structure by two moves. So yeah, that's where I came in with that. I just reckon that Cripper is just so important. Like one, he's a barometer for their team. Like yeah. Once he's moving, he's got five blokes hanging off him. Yeah. Another thing that I noticed just really quickly yeah. was, uh, did you see Jeremy Cameron's mark running back with the flight? Uh, I, I watched bits and pieces of the game because I was, I was uh, a little bit busy. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy Cameron, uh, forward line, big hospital ball. Comes up, Jeremy Cameron sprints back, That's runs right. back with the flight, takes yes. the chest mark, Jonathan Brown esque. And that just reminded me of when we had Lammy on the show, and Lammy was telling us about how Jezza Cameron is just absolutely fearless and loves And you know what the commentators picked up, and I actually really analyzed what they said after this. It's smart because he clearly looked at the ball, is it's a high flying ball. So when you've got a ball that's coming in high, um, and in, and the pack is moving backwards because it's going over the top. Mm. You're not having someone running at you, so it's actually smart courage because if it's a low ball that's darting in, 
someone's clearly going to be hitting it hard. So there's going to be a collision. Mm. But he's come back with the flow of the grain of the pack. So it's courageous. But it's also the right time to go with those sort of marks. Yep. You don't want to be going when someone's coming full head of steam at you and you're going to have a collision. So Speak for yourself, mate. I'd go when it's my turn. Oh, <laughs> here we go. But carry on. Moving on now. Um, how'd your predictions go this week, big boy? Yeah. So I my golden rogi was disgusting. <laughs> I said this week there'll be a lot of close games. There were the closest game was fifteen points. Um, yeah, well, no one was within a goal. So I've my golden rogi was a, a stinker once again. My tips weren't that great either. My Sunday it saved me. I got all the correct tips on the Sunday, but I only got four out of nine. But in saying that, my dead set certainly came through again. So I mean, at least I'm getting my certainties right, mate. What about yourself? I am O from four. <laughs> Dead set certainties. I, you have two punishments in the bank for me. Disgusting. 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 I, I, you are literally the grim reaper of I am. of tipping when it comes to a certainty. I've never seen. I've done some it. some recon though, and of the four weeks that I have tipped against teams, this is what's happened. This week, um, Essendon versus Collingwood. Essendon kicked ten goals two. Last week, oh god, who was my golden rogie again? My dead set certainty last week. Um, Richmond against Saints. Saints kicked 15 goals. Three. three. Yeah. The week before that, it was Carlton Geelong. Geelong kicks 14 goals, six. And the... Uh, well, yeah, Carlton did make that big comeback. The week before that, it was yeah. G- West Coast, uh, Gold Coast. Gold Coast kicked 14 goals, seven. So every time I put my dead set certainty against a team, like everything the other team touches turns to gold. So yeah. I just don't know what's wrong with that it's, it's it's a conspiracy yeah you, you, you've literally got the kiss of death like yeah the herald sun called up and i asked you if you wanted to take over that <laughs> role <laughs> as the kiss of death tipping <laughs> so very we'll, likely we'll get into the the tips in this week we've got uh john and brisbane and for me uh brisbane the last three games they've won by 30 points um and my golden rogie for this week is neil and lion to combine for 50 disposals kick two goals between them and the lions get the win Wow. Uh, I, I reckon it's very, very doable. And yeah, I just got a lot of love for Lion because he's come on this week. So Lions. Lions, sorry. Yeah, Lions? Get his name right, Ross. please, brother. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, now, who have you picked this week? I've gone Brizzy as well. Um, I think that it's going to be a close game. But for me, Brisbane are just too confident at the moment. Like Their confidence is sky high. And we had Jared Lyons, a little bit of a preview. He's talking about how well the midfield's gelling. You know, you've got Lockie Neal and him on the inside, then guys like Hugh McLuggage on the outside with that polish. And it's just, you can tell it's working well. Grant Birchall is another guy who's quietly going about his job and doing the Luke Hodge role of last year. Charlie Cameron, uh, Eric Hipwood, Dan McStay, who I'm going to touch on a bit later up forward. It's just, they're too confident. They're going too well. I think that they'll get over the Cats. Yep. Collingwood versus Hawthorne. Who and you got? I picked Brisbane by 20 points, by the way. Yep. Uh, Collingwood versus Hawks. I've gone Hawthorne by 11. <laughs> Purely because they're two teams that are in the same, uh, they're in the same sort of ballpark. They've come off a, a loss. They're sitting tenth and ninth. Um, but for me, Collingwood don't have side bottom. They don't have Dugowie, and I think the Hawth- Hawthorne has been in pretty good form. Besides, oh, with GWS, once again, GWS had twenty six inside fifties for seventeen scoring shots. They were incredibly infic- efficient. Yeah, the Hawks had like thirteen more inside fifties. So. If they just tweak, and I know Alistair, Alistair Clarkson is an uh, absolute whiz, they tweak that kind of efficiency in the inside 50, they should get the job done. Yep, and I went for Brisbane by 25, and I'm going to go for Collingwood here by 10 points. I think that, for me, they've got to bounce back, they've got to respond, and I think that they'll do it this week. I think that Braden Sire comes in, and he plays well. That's my opinion for that game. I think Sire will get... 20 plus. It's not my golden rogi, but it's, a, it's just my opinion for that game. Yep. Free man or St Kilda? Saints, and this is my absolute certainty. They have been in such good form. Uh, how could you tip against them? Free Mantle got over the line by 20 points against Adelaide. Adelaide aren't really in form. Free Mantle haven't really shown any sort of, you know, solid football. So for me, it's just a simple one. Saints are just clearly one of the form to- uh, sides at the moment. So Saints by 32. Yep. And it's a shame Nat Fife's not playing because I would have loved to have seen what yeah. Brett Ratton did in terms of tactically against Nat Fife. But yeah, for me, Saints by five goals. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, West Coast versus Adelaide. Uh, I have gone West Coast by 29 points against Adelaide. For me, I'm still not convinced with, convinced with West Coast because they beat a pretty 
lackluster Sydney outfit. So I'll get to that when Sydney come up. Um, but for me, Mad Adelaide are in a massive rut. Like at half time, the Crouch brothers and Laird all had 17 disposals each and the team had nothing to show for it. So like that's their best players. Uh, and w- whereas every other player on the field didn't have near as many disposals. So I just think something's, something's clearly not clicking down there. Um, they will get a scalp eventually, but it's going to be hard to kind of tip them. Right. Last week I said that uh, West Coast would beat Sydney, tip them, and they got up. You didn't, you tipped Sydney. But um, the reason why I tipped them was because I thought that they'd have that penny drop moment where like they really start firing again, things start clicking, and you know they shut up the they shut up the critics a little bit. That yeah. happened in the second quarter. Yeah. It was neck and neck, and then West Coast started to sort of take control. Josh Kennedy got a few marks. Jack Darling, Darling got a few marks. They started to click a little bit better. And uh, that, for me, has given me the assurance to put West Coast as my dead set certainty this week. So Huge. it should be a massive win by the Adelaide Crows. Well, um, <laughs> so give me that win because if you're tipping West Coast, I said to myself, whoever your dead set certainty was this week, you are the Grim Reaper. <laughs> so I'm changing my score and I'm putting Adelaide by one point. I'm you changing it <laughs> because, mate, you, you have been the absolute Grim Reaper. And as much as West Coast should win this game, they didn't beat a team that I was convinced. I think Sydney just did nothing. So I now tip Adelaide by one point as a Smokey and the Grim Reaper. You're probably going to do it again. Kiss of death, West Coast. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But I reckon West Coast by 40 points. Continuing from my point before I was so rudely interrupted, I think that 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 ball keeps rolling for them and they find a bit of form. And, you know, I think the Adelaide will be the... uh, the uh, lambs to the slaughterhouse, unfortunately. Yep. Melbourne versus Gold Coast. This is a statement game for me. I think Melbourne, they've only had one win by one point. Um, and then you look at the Gold Coast Suns. Uh, so Melbourne is sitting 17th. Suns are 6th. But every year, and I love the Suns. They're my boys. Every year they get three wins in a row real early. And then they drop off and don't have any anything else, any other close games. or They don't really show much. If they're going to be serious this year, and I think they can. Unfortunately, Rao got injured, but like their depth is so much more. Fiorini wasn't getting a game. He got edged out of the midfield, and he was, I think, fifth in their best and fairest last year. So they've got the depth. You, you boys really need to stand up this game. I've tipped the Suns by 13, but it's a statement game for either team. Because yep. Ds need to get their season rolling, and Suns need to stamp their form. I would actually agree with that in terms of the statement game. And I've gone for this week is my golden rogie and I've gone Suns to win by under a goal. I think it'll be a great game. I'm tipping game of the round. I can't put that in my golden rogie because that's obviously a subjective opinion. Yeah. But I think that it'll be game of the round. It'll be a bruising encounter between two teams who are hungry, hungry for this victory. And I think that the Gold Coast will just get up. And the interesting thing I just remembered was that when they played last time, Suns were up by a goal, I think with 40 seconds ago. And... D's happen to kick a point and a goal within the last 40 seconds of the game right. uh, to take the win. So that's another one they want to get back because that was a, a bit of an embarrassing loss. And if D's are to win, I'd say it'll be because of their big players, the physicality of their midfield, you know, Yovani and Petrarca and Clayton Oliver and those big boys. And I think that can be the place where the Suns come undone a little bit with those younger players, the smaller bodies. But we'll see how that goes. So Essendon versus North Melbourne. Uh, for me, I've gone Essendon by 19 points, purely and simply because of personnel. <coughs> Merritt will be coming back in, so that's a big tick. But on north side, they've got a few injury clouds. Now, Cunnington, he went off the game and they said that they probably shouldn't have played him. So I don't know where he's sitting injury-wise. We don't know, so we have to predict these a lot further in the future. Higgins came off, he got scans. And Taron Thomas, he's someone who has, the week before, I was so impressed by him. I didn't know much about him. And when he was around the ball, he was electric. He was out early as well with an injury. So that's, uh, yeah, that's... I've gotten my North tip wrong every week this year. Yeah. It's been like they've just continuously done what I thought that they weren't going to do. So, I mean, they I thought they'd beat the Dogs last week. And I was like, okay, this is kind of a smoky, but I yeah. reckon I'm on here. I thought stylistically they'd beat, beat the Dogs. But this week, I think that Bombers get over them. I think Bombers get over them by 15 points especially with Cunnington out now because he came back in. He was going to be a massive in for them, provide that grunt and that grit in the midfield that I feel like they really needed. Yeah. But he's not going to be there anymore. So for me, Bombers get up. 
Absolutely. And, and once again, the, the, the Bombers beat the Pies. They're in form. Uh, and North lost to the Dogs by 49. So it's a form thing as well. Uh, Port Adelaide versus GWS. Uh, I've gone for GWS by six points. I think it'll be a very, very, very close game. Um, and for me, I just I think they're very two similar teams. Port have come off a pretty embarrassing loss to the Lions. And I think when you have a loss like that, you should respond. But geez, it just shows maybe they're not quite where they're at. So no, I'd say, I'd, for me, I'd say that Port get the win here. They will bounce back. And I just don't think that the Giants, they've been put to the sword by the Doggies. I think they're in good form, but for me, Port Adelaide is still the form team of the competition. Going and playing away against the Lions is a really hard one. They've been belted around a little bit, but for me, they bounce back and they'll beat the Giants well, this week. Giants have just knocked off a big scalp in Hawthorne who have been in really good form. And admittedly, yes, they were very efficient in front of goals, but I looked at their stats and they've been very efficient the last few weeks. They don't get a lot of inside 50s compared to all the other play, uh, teams in the competition, but they are very efficient when they get the ball in. So their dynamic is really strong. I'm, I'm backing the Giants in. Absolutely. Yeah, fair enough, mate. But I just reckon that Port Adelaide will click again. There's a reason why they were the informed team of the competition before they played the Lions there. And they're still on top yep. of the ladder with this unbelievable percentage. They've been dominating the competition. So we'll agree to disagree there and we'll see how it goes, mate. Absolutely. Carlton versus Bulldogs. Uh, we've got Richmond versus Sydney. Yep, Richmond versus Sydney. Uh, for me, I've gone Richmond. Um, they, they're they going to be a little bit weaker because they do have injuries uh, a few of them, I think it was Cochin who was on the boundary. Um, who else? There was a couple of boys on the bit. Uh, Prestia, on, Cochin, and that's then right. Kervis. Prestia is going to get his ankle checked. Now, they're going up to the hub, and H Edwards and Hooley are alleged that they won't go up, obviously for family reasons. Hooley's just had a little kid. Yeah. Yep. So they're going to be a little bit uh, weaker in terms of personnel. But Sydney, honestly, this week they frustrated me. For the last two weeks, I've backed them in, and no more because... You look at their setup, as soon as it gets past halfway and they're moving forward, they've got no one to kick it to. Tom Papley is the only thing saving them right now. Uh, in the last week, he's kicked, I think, out of their 12 goals, I think he's kicked five of them. Um, and Blakey is another one who I kind of am impressed with. He, he gives them a little bit. But other than that, they're, they're, they're relying on people that just aren't there. And Buddy not being there is clearly a God, he straightens them up. Yeah, he? He, 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 he has their option and he just centers them with at least a long kick down the line to someone who's going to present and give you a contest. But for me, yeah, the last, what is it? 39 and 43 points, I think they lost by. Yep. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very, very hard. To no, um, sorry, that was their score. The last, they've only kicked 33, 39 and right. 43. I think it'll be a close game. I think that the uh, Tigers will beat them by 13 points but they're both going to be down on personnel a little bit and yeah. probably won't be the best game I'd say, but who knows? Carlton versus Doggies. Carlton versus, Carlton versus Bulldogs. Um, Bulldogs by 16 points. I've tipped against them the last couple of weeks with Smokies. I can't tip against them again. So they're in great form. Uh, 16 points. I still reckon they could probably beat them by Carlton by a bit more, but Carlton have, um, you know, they've been in every single game. So, you know, they're not someone to kind of like, swipe off this year they're doing really really well but mm. for me uh the bulldogs form is too strong the last three games in total they've won by 100 points collectively all, all together um and with carlton they've been within yeah three or four goals and what else did i say they start oh if they start strong this is the point i wanted to make sorry that's why i was looking at my sheets if carlton do start off strong though they come home very strongly so that's where i think if carlton in this game up at halftime, it could be anyone's ball game, but right. doggies by 16. For me, doggies by 37. I've backed, ag backed against them for a few weeks in a row now and uh, been forced to eat my words. So this week I'm going for them and emphatically 37 points for the uh, for the doggies. Massive, now. mate. Now, what caught Moose's eye? Now, what caught Moose's eye this week? What kind of a sting am I going to give you? Oh, this is special. It's good. This we'll is special. Happy. It's positive. Here we go. And ah. it's positive because I want to shine the light on a few unbelievable talents that I'm just loving watching at the moment. First of which being Christian Petrarca. Now, he has the ability. Uh, like he's big. He's strong. He's quick. He's athletic. But the thing that I was noticing this week was the nous. Every time he's in front of the ball, he knows he's surrounding. He's been doing these little taps to the players next to him. The ball, he's just constantly getting the ball forward. His skills are so clean. His kicking was amazing this week. His forward 50 entries. And I'm just so happy to see a player like that starting to live up to his potential because I think that with the tools that he has, 
he could be a generational player. And he was your bolter at the start of the year, so I'll give give you the pump up there. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because amongst everything of his accolades, he was my bolter. So he has, he came into this game, the first quarter he had 14 disposals. The next person that was closest was eight disposals. In the first quarter of a a game where you only have 80% game time. So it's in 16 minutes. Incredible. And every time he touches the ball, he does something with it. He's just so impressive. His kick, like I said, he holds the ball. The way he holds and grips the ball, it tilts a bit lower, so his kicks are a lot more darting, mm. just the, the angle in which he holds it. And, mate, whenever he's around the ball, he makes something happen. It's yeah. really impressive. Another, another one. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here a bit, Ponchy. Um, <coughs> roses are red. Ponch loves b- beer. Is that? Radical <laughs> Where are you going with this? You said it before. I didn't think. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it is radical. Yeah. He was flying and clunking absolutely everything oh, yeah. on the weekend. That was impressive. His athletic ability and his jukes are just beautiful to watch. I was loving it. Another one who was doing the same thing, Dan McStay. He's playing that higher half forward role. And he was just clunking absolutely everything. He looks more free. He looks more confident. I'm loving what the Lions are doing with him. So those three, I'm putting a spotlight on this week. and They have caught my eye. Well, that is all for our first half segment. Now, I'm going to let you pump up our next guest because you're a Brisbane Lions fan. I most what definitely am. Jared Lyons. Now, he's been in career best form. He has probably gotten best on, if not up there, the last two weeks. And the Lions are absolutely red hot at the moment. So I could not be happier to have him on. He's also a bloody ripper bloke. And we got a few little good stitch yeah, ups. Got a- you got managed to get on to Luke Hodge, which was just yeah. So his sister Haley uh, helped us out with that one, and she sent me through a couple of ripping stitch ups. So thank you once again because it was very last minute, and they were very very uh, helpful with everything. So I hope you guys enjoy this interview. <laughs> Moosey, what's happening, mate? You look a bit nervous, mate. Jared Lyons is on the line. You know how much of a big Brisbane Lions supporter I am. You are the biggest Brisbane Lions supporter, but you've got to get your head wrapped around this one, mate. I know, Ponchy, but do you reckon the Big O will watch? Of course the Big O's watching. It's the greatest show on earth. <laughs> now get your head in the gear. Massive interview. Get up and about, Moosey. Let's go. <laughs> All righty, so we are here with Jared Lyons, guys. Pick 61 in the 2010 draft to the Adelaide Crows. Went on to spend a bit of time with the Gold Coast Suns and now in career best form at the Lions. Jared, give us a hello game day, brother. Hello game day. You love it. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. Great. How mate. are you today, mate? Uh, very good, mate. Very good after the weekend. Yeah, very nice. Massive win. Big scalp over the Port Adelaide Footy Club, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah a bit of a top of the table clash, and they're playing some great footy. So um, it was probably nice to come up against a really good side and uh, probably bring our best and uh, yeah, really show what we had. Absolutely. Now, mate, we're going to get into a few stitch-ups to start things off, if you don't mind. And we're going to start young. So when you were in the under-17s grand final, apparently you have taken one of the all-time hangers and missed the goal from right in front. Is there any truth to this? Uh, <laughs> truth to the hanger. And I'll keep the goal because it was in the goal square. So it would have been embarrassing if I hadn't missed it. And there's <laughs> <goal square. laughs> So you, we've been yeah, Well, apparently Corey said that you missed it from the top of the goal, goal square. So we've been nah, no, I um, I kicked it, and the, I think the game has been filmed as well. So, so you've got the evidence to corroborate your story. I've got, I've got evidence. <laughs> oh, awesome! And mate, we've got some stitch ups from Luke Hodge for you here. So, word by Lukey Hodge is that apparently you have very old man Achilles. <laughs> Well, I did, yeah. A couple of years ago, I could barely walk um, for about four or five weeks with my Achilles. And then uh, I don't know what happened, but I finally got him right last year. And uh, it's turned into probably a good couple of years of footy. But coming from him, he would have four ice packs on, uh, one on each knee, one on each Achilles <laughs> after a game last year. So that's very much pot kettle black there. Now, I'm not sure if I believe you because we've got two sides to the story, obviously. Hodgie tells us that even though he's retired and probably enjoying his tucker, he is still quicker than you. (laughs) (laughs) Not the way he is now. He's put on 15 kilos already. (laughs) He's enjoying retirement. (laughs) He he should be. He he swallowed a pillow. (laughs) (laughs) 
one last one from Hodgie, and he says that, and I don't know about this from Hodgie, because he's a big pointer, but he says that you point more than you run. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'll give him that one. I would be so, a pointer. Uh, <laughs> back in the Adelaide Crows days as well, mate, um, you were known as the AFL sub king, so is there any truth to that? Yeah, I reckon I was green vest probably 14 or 15 times. Definitely in the top three of all time. I think Aaron Young from Port Adelaide was up there with me. Yeah, so I got this. I got the stat that it was nine out of nine out of thirteen in uh, season two thousand and fifteen, and I've heard that at the end of that year you got a, a Chris Kringle from the Crouch Brothers, and it was a green vest. Yeah, that is, that is true. Very true. <laughs> And I, thought, um, I think that Matt is the most unorganised bloke. He didn't have a present to get, and he just grabbed the vest from the top of the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a classic stitch up. Now the last one we've got, mate, and we'll let you tell whatever part of the story you want. Uh, it was an off season in Bali. You've been on the cordials a little bit, and you've ended up in the wrong villa. So, do you want to give us a bit more story on that? Uh, it was Thailand, actually, Koh Samui, and. Yeah, they, the, the Chang beer, they call it the jungle juice. <laughs> I would obviously had a few too many with Brody Smith and uh, Aiden Riley and can't remember anything other than apparently I was gone out of the villa for about an hour. This is like in the middle of the night and I was completely naked and just running into other people's houses <laughs> <laughs> and knocking on their windows and doors and I had, I had no recollection of it at all. Oh, there's definitely something different in those beers over there. So that's the uh, that's the stitch we got for you this week, mate. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Good now from boys. A f- Good <laughs> Thanks, mate. We do our best. Um, now from a footballing side of things, uh, at what point did you think that football could have been a career pre-getting drafted? Uh, oh, probably later than a lot of people. I was... Um, <clears throat> Playing a lot of cricket early days, uh, and I, my love for cricket probably was more than my love for footy um, until I think under 16s I made, or under 16s or 17s, I made the decision to stop playing cricket and focus on footy and just got invited to, I think it was after that under 17s grand final, um, we, we lost and got invited to train with the Dragons that pre season for under 18s. I so hadn't been doing any real rep footy at all and um, yeah went down to the Dragons that 18s year and yeah ended up playing every game and um, yeah put my name up and yeah got picked fairly late by the Crows Lovely, so man. probably when I was 16 or 17 was when I really thought oh, I'll give this a crack man that's awesome and at what uh, going for that sorry which teams were giving you the most interest obviously besides Adelaide uh, oh, not a heap. I reckon I might have had five interviews or so over the time. Probably North Melbourne, maybe a little bit um, off the top of my head. But Crows were the the main one. Um, they were probably the one that I had all my eggs in the basket. And if I didn't go there, I didn't really expect to go anywhere. So that was- yeah. Lovely, mate. Now, pushing forward to uh, your time at Adelaide, and you didn't debut in your first year, but the second year in 2012, you got to debut in round five, and it was during a showdown against Port Adelaide, which is massive. <coughs> so can you talk us through that experience? Yeah, it was... Uh, well, that was the days of the sub as well, and I was meant to be wearing the uh, the green vest um, <laughs> for game one, but I think Jason Port Pleasure... Uh, went down with a shoulder a few days before and I actually, yeah, got, got the tap on the shoulder and said, yeah, you're in, uh, you're going to play a full game, mate. And uh, so that was good, um, really good experience. And obviously a showdown, there was well, 40, 50,000 at Amy Stadium and uh, a few of my mates, like all the boys from school and stuff, drove up, um, <laughs> made the nine-hour trek from Melbourne to Adelaide to, to come watch, which was pretty special. Um, and... I think we got up by about no, 10, 14 points or something like that. So, yeah, it was an a amazing experience. Yeah, there, there probably isn't too many other debuts that could top that being in a showdown or in a big game like that. So that's bloody awesome, mate, for you. Um, now, in 2013, there was considerable interest from Melbourne, I think, the late at the end of that year. So was there any kind of chance you were going to move over or you were pretty settled at the Crows at that point? Uh, very close. I did. Um, I had a, a meeting with Rosie and the Melbourne Melbourne staff 
in Melbourne. Um, yeah, so very close, but yeah, just I think they might have got someone else a bit later in that trade period, and uh, it was a like for like, so they they went with that player who I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. Um, so then, our, yeah, our deal fell through, and I was quite happy to stay at Adelaide. I was enjoying my time there, so yeah, ended yeah. up staying. Well, they'd be pretty flat they don't have you at the moment, mate, because your form is unreal. Uh, another one is late 2014. I didn't know this. I did a bit of research. You got a, a spider bite or so, something on your leg or something on the lines, and you were hospitalised. So what happened there? Yeah, it was. Uh, it would have been pre-season, so yeah, really late 2014, like November, start of pre-season, and uh, yeah, I just I woke up with a, a bite of some sort on my leg, and it just got worse and worse and worse, and ended up sort of getting very infected and I spent I think it was eight days in hospital just on a drip every six hours trying to get rid of the infection so Jeez. I reckon I missed about four weeks of training which you know yeah at that time of the year um, when the boys are flying and you, you try to put your name up when I hadn't been playing a lot of footy it uh, yeah, probably affected my year a fair bit which is a bit annoying I've got some great photos of them too <laughs> I'll, I can send you them through if you want. I'll send them well, to your phone. Yeah, we might send them through and we'll get them chucked up on the screen if you're happy to do that uh, when we release this. They're not uh, great viewing, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving forward now to 2016, uh, you're in your career best form up to this date. Uh, the stats that I've got here on the on the paper, you, were, you played 20, 20 games, averaged 22 disposals and nearly a goal a game. How did then you lead to uh, getting traded to the Suns? Uh, I think it was, I guess, Adelaide were in such a strong position at that time. Uh, we had a lot of midfielders, a lot of young players coming through, like the Crouch brothers, and uh, you had Rory Sloan, who was at the peak. Um, there was Hugh Greenwood coming through. There was a lot of players probably similar to me, and I guess the club didn't see me being probably where my management saw me at um, and myself and there wasn't a lot in it to be honest it was it was fairly minute but the, the club didn't want to budge and Gold Coast came with a, a three-year offer which was a year more and um, yeah three years when I'd sort of been in and out of the side a lot um, was good security so yeah there wasn't I was always expecting to stay at the Crows after that year but yeah things just didn't pan out and um so the Gold Coast swooped in at the right time. Lovely. Yeah, well, that's a bit disappointing for them as well. Seeing as they made the grand final 2017, a, a player of your calibre probably would have helped them a lot. Uh, so the next question I have, and I want to rattle off some stats for you and kind of dig in. So the two years at the Suns, you played 37 games. You've averaged 25 disposals. And in your second year, you were third in clearances uh, for the AFL. You end up getting delisted, um, and you come to Brisbane with absolutely no trade value whatsoever, which is ridiculous. And then in your first year, you get 13 Brownlow votes, and you're fourth in the best and fairest. So with that, the question I want to ask is, even though you're still uh, playing in the midfield for both teams, uh, what approach has Fagan and the Lions got um, out of you that the Suns clearly missed? Uh, oh, I guess that the second year at the Suns, I was playing... Um playing injured a lot, like a fair ankle injury from the year before that I carried through to the next year and uh, didn't actually get surgery on, which looking back I should have. And I just, it just hampered, that's why I was playing a lot of inside, but I couldn't, I couldn't run outside. And uh, in a team that was losing a lot, it kind of it probably got exposed a little bit, um, which is probably why, yeah, that they saw me where I was. Um, at the end of that year with Gold Coast, had surgery and, and come back really well, but they just, I think they'd already moved on and, and Brisbane had come come knocking. And to be honest, I would have still been at Gold Coast because I still had a year left on my contract if uh, Brisbane didn't come. So it was more a mutual agreement for me to leave rather than being delisted in, in a way, but that was the only way to get the deal done. Um, and yeah, just I think putting in that inside stuff that I've always had, I had a really good pre-season uh, yeah, last year, like no injuries, got through really well, got myself fit, and um, I think that translated to a, a really good on-field performance. And I think the midfield there um, probably 
complements me well with uh, a lot of great outside players like Barry, McCluggage. Um, these guys are really polished on the outside. Um, Mitch Robertson playing on the wing now. And then me and sort of Lockie Neal inside, it just it just gelled together really well. And um, yeah, there wasn't, there was no hard feelings leaving Gold Coast. I mean, it, it sort of, everyone blew it up a little bit, but it was just a shake, a handshake and a, and a thanks for, my, for having me boys and um, yeah, good luck sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with where I ended up. And I think Gold Coast have finally put it all together now as well, which is it's good to see. Yeah, I think it's awesome to see, mate, that... Um some players kind of get moved around and some players struggle in a different environment and then they flourish, which you have in Brisbane. So I just, like personally, it's awesome just to see you going very well. Yeah, and as a Brisbane Lions supporter, it's amazing to see. And the dynamic that you talk about there with yourself and Lockie McNeil and then the more polished players, it's, it's, it's evident. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you was your career best form has coincided with a few big things in your personal life as well. In 2018, you married your wife, Savannah and you've had your firstborn child, Sebastian, in 2019. Is that sort of added motivation for you to get to where you are now? Uh, yeah, I mean, probably get it. Like, I've been with Seb for seven or eight years now, so yeah, really settled off field. And uh, having Seb last year was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Um, it's certainly, I'm, I'm one that loves a beer and, and enjoys a time with the boys, and it's certainly, uh, trying to find that balance now where um, family sort of comes first and he's been amazing like he's honestly slept really well and, and he's sort of hasn't been hard work at all so it's actually been really good and uh, yeah it, it does give you something to look forward to when you come home it gives you a purpose to play for as long as you can and um, yeah play till probably he can he's old enough to remember me playing would be nice um, which I'm 28 this year, hopefully get the 30, 31 would be nice. But yeah, it is. It's pretty special having uh, something off field now and, and I guess growing up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm a Brisbane boy as well, so I know that the lifestyle up there is, uh, is a pretty good one. Uh, so every week we have uh, a question from Everything AFL HQ, which is a, a page that we love. So this week the question is, would you rather Lockie Neal's calves or Stefan Martin's biceps? <laughs> oh jeez! Oh, can I have both? <laughs> um, uh, oh, my calves aren't too bad myself, so I'll take Steph Martin's. <laughs> the, the time he spends in the gym, you realise why they're so big. Whereas Lockies are just natural; they they come out born with those calves. But Steph puts in a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, Moving on now, Chris Fagan has had such an amazing impact on the Lions. And as a Lions supporter, uh, it's amazing to see because we had that massive exodus. And I think it was 2013 where we lost, you know, Doherty and Elliot Yo and the likes. And it was heartbreaking to see. Since then, it seems like the culture at the club has really taken a turn for the better. What has sort of been implemented and how is everyone, you know, keeping happy these days? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I probably only know from the outside looking in. Wow, uh, early days, what was going on? Um, but from what the boys have said, it just it wasn't a great environment to be in, professional wise. Like, yeah, it was fun. The boys were having fun off field, but the professional stuff wasn't sort of clicking. And uh, I think when Fags came in, he knew it was going to be a journey. And um, obviously, those first couple of years, they, well, there was only four wins and then five wins. But I think he. He got the right people in. Um, David Noble's a massive one from Adelaide Crows behind the scenes who's done a lot of work um, sort of recruiting and, and getting the footy department right. And, yeah, I think it's all about building that the, the base level of getting the right people and then it just grows from there. And I think that's what Fags did, brought in all the right people, got the right draft picks, got in um, some really good kids and uh, some good older players as well, which, which certainly helps. Um, and yeah, from there, we just, the boys have gelled together really well. They're still, like, it's such a family club. Um, being in Queensland, you don't get that sort of Victorian feel. And a lot of guys are from Victoria, so no one really has a lot of family here. So you kind of have to be your own family as a, as a club, um, which I've noticed both Gold Coast and here are very similar in that way. Um, so all the boys are really close, um, which definitely helps on field because when you have, success on field and you can share it all together it's um yeah it's been sort of amazing the last couple of years so yeah i'm really proud of the club and where it's come now 
Yeah, and the, the, the plan that has been put in place is really coming to fruition and you guys are reaping the rewards now. And that sort of culminated in you making the finals last year, obviously finishing second on the ladder from memory. Um, but uh, you, you lost both games in the finals, but it seemed like last year you guys maybe just weren't destined to go all the way because you know it was a very, very rapid rise for you. This year, it seems like a more mature outfit and you guys seem... I'm going to touch wood here, but you seem destined to really give it a shake this year. So how are you feeling about that? Um, yeah, well, it's obviously a very different year at the moment. Um, I think last year we oh, we played really well in those finals. I mean, the Richmond game, we just didn't kick straight, which put us out of the game really quickly. And uh, the GWS game, we had it probably had it won with two or three minutes to go. And just couldn't couldn't finish it and those, both those teams end up in the grand final so I think we're a lot closer than what people thought um, but yeah I, I think the maturity of, of the group from from losing those finals is is uh, is a massive one um, the boys got a taste of finals footy a lot of those guys I reckon 75 percent of the playing group wouldn't have played finals footy so yeah it does it certainly helps and um, I think the boys are, are itching no matter what this year brings it's a tough year it's probably going to be whoever can sort of survive the longest with all that's going on so yeah we're we're really excited we're obviously pretty lucky to play a few games at the Gabba in a row um but now we're, we're going to hit the road this week and yeah take whatever's in our stride well good luck with it mate and it is a great time to be a Brisbane Lions supporter I'll tell you that much if you could sort of look back in your career and say what are the sort of biggest highlights and the most memorable moments for you what would some of them be uh, that 2016 year at the Crows was probably, I guess, my coming of age sort of thing. Um, I think I played 20 games through the year. We played a couple of finals. We won a final um, at Adelaide Oval, which was an amazing feeling. Um, and yeah, so I reckon that that 2016 year where I finally put it all together was probably what kickstarted my career. So I reckon that year would be up there. And then probably last year was. Um, yeah, one of my favourite years as well. Obviously, individually playing well, but playing really well as a team. And um, yeah, finishing second on the ladder is not, not something you can be uh, scoffed at. So yeah, that was really exciting too. Yeah, absolutely. And if you could say that there was one best forward, mid and defender from all three clubs that you've played for, who would those oh. three guys be? And if <laughs> you want to put anyone on the pine... Maybe Hodge deserves to be on the point. <laughs> yeah. well, I've actually, uh, I, I drew up a, my best 22 from who I've played with over the uh, COVID period when we had all that time off and it was a fair side. Um, I think forward, it would be go, hard to go past Eddie Betts. Um, yeah, when, it, when he was in his prime and he's still going pretty well, but he was incredible to play with. So unselfish, but at the same time, such a superstar. Um, He'd be my forward. Uh, midfield. Gee, Ablett or Dangerfield. I don't know. Tough one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you take either, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think you... Um, yeah. Well, one Not of fair those to pick two. sides there. <laughs> yeah, to pick one of those two. Um, yeah, they're obviously two unbelievable players. Gav's one of the best of all time. Danger, still plenty to come. Uh, Forward-wise, gee... Tommy Lynch from when I played with him at Gold Coast, the Richmond now. He's a fair uh, fair specimen up forward. Pretty hard to stop. Oh, sorry, I've already said forward, I don't know. Backs. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Keep <laughs> 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 him going. Uh, back wise, yeah, I mean, Hodgie would be uh, fuming at me if I didn't put him in there. Um, one of the, I don't know if he's a true backman, though, to be honest. Um, but yeah, playing with him. Just for one year, um, it's, a, it's it's you can easily see why he was one of the best, and uh, he's won four flags. And I don't like pumping him up, but um, yeah, he's uh, he's definitely one of the best players I've I've played with too. Um, he just sets everything up from the back line. You can hear him from the forward pocket. So um, yeah, it'd, it'd have to be, I guess, um, resume resume wise, yeah, the best back one I've played with. I'm surprised Hodgie got in there after those stitch ups <laughs> yeah. that he gave you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a fair side, and we actually I'd love to see the side if you if you wanted to send it to us. But one man I'm surprised who didn't get in there was the big O, Oscar McInerney. And I was wondering, <laughs> my last question for you is can you put in a good word for us to the big O and ask him if he could come on the podcast one day? 
<laughs> oh, I certainly can. Oh, he's a <laughs> he's a gentle giant, Big O. He um he wouldn't hurt a fly. Uh, but he's a serious player too. Um, yeah, he's he's one of the great people at the footy club. Um, really, really nice guy. I'm sure he'd be happy to come on. So I'll put in a word. So I've heard. Yeah, he looks like a cult figure. How yeah. could you miss the big boy? He's unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got anything else, Ponchy? No, that's that's it from us, Matt. So once again, really want to thank you for coming on because it was a bit last minute. So we really appreciate you. Uh, giving us a bit more insight into you and uh, accepting the stitch-ups that we had for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, boys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers, guys. Okay, so that was our interview with Jared Lyons, one of the great Brisbane Lions players at the moment. What do you reckon, Ponchy Boy? Uh, first and foremost, fellow St. Peter's boy, so grateful for him to come on. Um, I love it when someone comes on and they can have a laugh with our stitch ups. That's my favorite part. I love digging and getting a few stories. So he enjoyed that. And once again, a bit of insight to someone that people might not know as much about, but he's in scintillating form, scintillating form. So I'm very excited to see how he goes this year in the Brisbane Lions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jared, uh, for coming on mate. And you know, his sister as well for giving us all of that great information and Hodgie for the stitch ups, but yeah, find us at hello game day at Instagram guys, because we're going to be posting the team that Jared wrote down in isolation, the best players he ever played with. So hope everyone enjoyed the interview. I've been the Ponch. I've been the Moose. And next time you tune in, bring a mate. Thank you for tuning in to the Hello Game Day podcast. If you're listening right now, that means you've made it to the end of the episode and maybe even enjoyed what you've heard. If so, you can join us on all major social media platforms as well as audio podcasting platforms and YouTube. Or just head on over to our website at www.hellogameday.co and hit subscribe to join our mailing list where you can receive weekly updates on the podcast. We'd like to give a massive thank you to our producer, Ethan Curtin. Find him on Instagram at Room10Company, as well as Equal Tech, who have given us an office space to work in. And our beautiful graphic design is done by Chev at Graphic Design. He's been the punch. He's been the moose. And next time you drop in, bring a mate.